Oh, I got you muted. Oh, oh. that's why sounds not oh. coming out of that. Okay. <laughs> well, well, I guess I don't know. All right, give it a try. All right, is that good? That's good. All right. I didn't know it took so many mics and mess to do this, but crap, we're gonna do it, I guess. All right. Um, it's the 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 virtual tours actually is a really good segue. Uh, to what I'm going to talk about, and uh, I don't remember when we were when this whole thing was planned, and we was getting ready to do this, and um, but anyway, I've I've actually met with about four different groups of people since we said I was going to do this talk up here. That people specifically asking questions about futures and options and risk management, and. I don't know where Dr. Rawls went, but there he is. But um, when I filled his position eight years ago, um, he had a heavy emphasis on risk management. and Some people listened and some people didn't, right, Dr. Rawls? And that's the same thing that happens today. Some people listen and some people don't. And you find out what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And some things you're uh, willing to do and some things you're not willing to do. And um, when Dr. Rawls asked that, question about buying a call, it, it kind of, it does have some speculative position to it because you're forgoing some money for the opportunity. But anyway, I don't know, how many people keep up with the futures market? That's either live cattle or feeder cattle futures on a daily basis. I'm glad to see that because that's very important. So number one, you know it exists. And if you don't keep up with it on a daily basis, then you need to start because what was said up here a few minutes ago is that we've hit the market has taken a hit in feeder cattle and finished cattle both. Finished cattle have probably been worse than feeder cattle. Um, I guess, actually, I guess live cattle are off about, uh, for the March contract, probably something like $12 off of where they were starting out in, huh? It, off 17 for April. Uh, that's what I'm, I said March, didn't I? And it's April, you're right. Yeah, because February, I'm sorry. Thank you, Tom. Uh, somebody's got to correct misstatements. I'm glad I have somebody. Um, but but we're off big time, and and the feeder cattle market is taking a hit, and that's where a lot of people in in this room will focus. But live cattle just is important, and all these strategies can be can be employed regardless of what you're looking at. It was said up here, went to a mar a, what a milk market class is that what it was? And I mean they, they work the same. Um, the, what I wish I could do with most people when I'm trying to talk about futures and options is I wish I could just wipe your whole slate clean on what you think you know about them and how they operate, and then we just start over. Because most of the time it takes longer to get people out of misconceptions on how they actually work. They can understand prices going up, David, or going down. That's not, that's not hard to understand. Oh, they went up. Well, that's, that's, that's a good thing if I'm selling. It's a bad thing if I'm buying. Oh, they went down. That's a, they understand that, but actually understanding that the certain moves that you can make throughout using that tool, right? I mean, because that's all it is. It's a tool. And I use the term uh, profit goal, and essentially that's what you're doing, right? You've got a profit goal. You say, I want to make this many dollars on this, and so if I can lock in a price that gives me my profit goal, that's where we're going. We're going to move about a business. And so that's where I focus. You mentioned break even. Great. It's great to know what your break even price is, but ain't nobody in this business to break even. If you are, nothing I say will matter. You might as well just keep doing what you're doing. I mean, that, that's a true statement. It's not a break even game that we're in. So I don't have a whole lot of slides, and I don't really have enough time to do all this. Uh, I bet I have like 12 slides or something, but it's not going to be enough time in 45 minutes to cover what really needs to be here. We deal with a lot of these, a lot of these risks, and we're going to focus on this cattle price thing. Jimmy, I apologize. You're going to see a couple slides that you've seen before, but I hope they still convey the message. I've got two two things graphed up here from from January 1, 2016, to February 6, 2020. I think that's when I put this this thing together. So I just didn't worry about getting the last 20 days, Dr. Rawls. I didn't know. I didn't think it's going to be that important to convey a message. The last 20 days isn't going to matter. Even though we had we dropped the limit on Monday and then dropped another whatever on the futures mark a dollar and a half two dollars yesterday and now we're up a few cents today and nobody really cares because a few cents don't mean anything when you just lost six dollars. All right, just doesn't matter. But what I want you to understand. All right, we have what we call the nearby futures 
the, in, in, it's just nearby feeder cattle futures. That's the blue line. If you're colorblind, I apologize. The, the orange line, so that's the nearby feeder cattle futures. We've got, uh, I guess it's eight feeder cattle contracts. Isn't that correct? There's eight feeder cattle contracts. And so right now we would be on the march. I guess that's why my, my mind was on march because we only have six live cattle contracts, and they're every other month starting with February. But nearby is whichever one's closest to us. That's what nearby means. And so when March is over, we'll go to the April on feeder cattle. And then we'll go to the May. And then we'll jump to August. Because there's nothing for June and July. It's that simple. So that's all that represents. Is every day we had a close on, on the futures market. So that blue line represents that price. Then the orange line, y'all do realize why I used orange and blue, correct? Y'all with me on that? Auburn, War Eagle, War Eagle. That was that was for that was for uh, Lou because Lou was here earlier and he's he's an Auburn grad. But the CME feeder cattle index are actual cash prices out west. It's a seven-day weighted rolling average of 700 to 900 pound steers that are in the states of Texas, Oklahoma, uh, Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, Missouri, the Dakotas. Um, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, and uh, New Mexico. I think that's the 12 states. Um, anyway, it's close enough. It's just, it, it is the cash price. And what we know, and the reason why I have them graphed up here together, and y'all see how closely they run with each other? They're on top of each other all the time, aren't they? So the, the futures price is supposed to represent an 800-pound steer out west. And so... Those two markets have to be very similar. Now, what do we know about feeder cattle prices in Tennessee and Kentucky? They're lower than where they are out west, right? I don't care. Our cash prices move the same as their cash prices, up or down, either way. So that's the first thing I want you to understand, is cash prices actually do follow the futures market. Now, David, I know there's times when basis gets a little out of whack, and, and it actually probably happens more in live cattle, or really has here lately, than in feeder cattle, but basis can get out of whack. And basis is just the difference between the, the cash price and the futures price. Actually, that was backwards to y'all, because y'all read left or right. The cash price minus the futures price gives us some basis. And right now, it's saying sell your, sell your finished cattle. Sell them, sell them, sell them, because cash price is still is, it's been sitting at 119, 120, and we got live cattle just tanking. So why would I hold them if I'm expecting futures prices to be lower? You wouldn't. You wouldn't. Unless you need to feed them to hit that value market to get those premiums, right? That's a, and that's a balance. But I want you to just know that the two markets work together. So what I've got is I've got three graphs here that all look the same. This is for the March contract because we're almost to March. And then I've got one for August and November because I have a feeling most people, a lot of people in here will be selling cattle somewhere in there. So for y'all over there, you can look at that one or you can look over here. I, I don't mean to. So I've got, again, I've got my March feeder, cattle futures, on my blue line. And it's going across there. But that's just for March. And you can see where my, my feeder cattle index has some gap between my, my futures price, right? Y'all see that? Because we're not always in March. We're not always in March. But every time we get to March, which that would be, let's see, that looks like March. That looks like March. Do you see that they cross? Don't worry about the gray lines yet. But do y'all see where they cross? They cross every, every March, don't they? Well, that's, that helps us with that basis thing issue that we've got. That helps us know that, hey, we're actually expecting to meet together, Dr. Rawls. They actually going to meet. They, they meet where they're supposed to. But then this gray line, that gray line is what that index was, and I wanted you to see the entire previous year, that was the actual cash price that was received right there. And look how many opportunities. If that, if that blue line is above that gray line, we could have priced cattle higher at some point in that 12-month period prior to that. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Who doesn't understand what I'm saying? That might be a better question. Would anybody raise their hand if I... If No, you wouldn't. 
All right. But the, but the simple of this is if you always take the cash price on the day that you're going to physically sell cattle, if you take the cash price, there were probably opportunities somewhere within the time period that you own those cattle that you could have got a higher price. Than, or, or let me put it this way. They had a higher value at some point along the way than what you actually got out of them when you physically sold them. Maybe that's a better way of saying that. They physically had a higher value at some point. So when we look at that, and there's times when not, there, there's not a whole lot of alternatives. Because if you would have bought cattle in the fall of 16, well, you, you were better off just letting them ride, weren't you? You were just better off letting them ride. But then you get into 17, and look at, I mean, there's, there's times when we're talking about $20 a hundredweight. And if you, if you actually have a profit goal and you're looking at the market, because I have a feeling you said the market went down and price and cattle, I ain't touching anything on the futures or options market right now. Today, yesterday, no, there's no chance of it. Why? Why would I not touch anything? Because things are terrible. I, I mean, they can only go to zero. <laughs> right? So I feel like there'll be a better opportunity as we move forward for cattle that were purchased within the past week or two weeks or whatever it is. So we go back to 18, going into to the March of 19. There were a lot of opportunities that we could have priced cattle that we didn't take advantage of. The point of this is not to hit the top of the market. The point of this is to have a profit goal and know that if you can't forward contract them, if you can forward contract them and meet your objective, have at it. Get the job done. If you can't, you have to watch this market to see if there's a time when there's value in your animals that you can capture that will meet the goals that you have set forth. Am I making sense to you? Here's, here's August. Again, several opportunities. Now, I'll tell you, I took advantage of a great opportunity because I'm not a big stocker producer. I just piddle with it. Um, I piddle with it. But, like, this was a no-brainer. Um, marketing cattle for, for, for last year, on, I, I guess I was marketing in August, whatever it was. But doesn't matter. We've got a futures price up here at 160, and we had a cash price down here, 142, 143. And what I know, and that was, that's, that's looking at August, so the cash price in in April or March April was 143 for these for these cattle. 143 is what the cash they were trading for cash. But they were telling me the futures market was telling me they were going to go 160. Here's one these are the two things I know from what I've already said Dr. Ross, they're going to have to meet in August. So if cash prices actually go to 160 and they were only 143, that means I'm $17 a hundred weight better off when I finally get to August. And $17 extra a hundred weight was going to make me butt tons of money. Or if, if the cash price didn't go there, if I went ahead and locked me in a price and things went south, I, I got it. I mean, I'm set. Now, that, that type of opportunity doesn't always exist. That's a rarity. That's a rarity. Because I'm not a genius. I'm not that sharp. But that one was easy to see. That one was easy to see. There's the same thing for November. doesn't really matter. But if you take anything, just look at that first, that first thought up there. These are just my thoughts. I don't have a whole lot to say because I don't expect... You know, you, if you take 10% of what I say and use it today, I would, I would think that's a large percentage of using information that I, that I tried to trans, trans, transfer to you from me. But if I could get people to think that marketing and selling did not have to occur on the same day, I would, I mean, th that, would, that, that could exceed everything I've done in my previous eight years of working for the University of Tennessee. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. But if you don't know your cost, how can you know what price will get you where you need to be? 
right? I bet most people in here actually do know their cost. Most people in here do know their cost. But as I showed you earlier, very rarely does sale day have the highest price. Wait, do I need to remind you? Now they did there. We did there, but not there, not there, not there, and probably not this year. So one out of five years, sale day actually had the highest price. Who wants to take those odds? I, I guess I take the... I also do just a little bit of row crop farming. Not enough... To, I mean, it's a piddly amount. Piddly. I'm piddly with stocker cattle. I'm piddly with, with row crops. And that's what it is. I'm very piddly. But it gives me... It gives me some false credibility in my mind, David, some false credibility. Because I, st I start thinking more on... on there, are, there are a lot of ways to market grain crops, a lot of different ways. And you can... Most people can call up their elevator, Tom, and they can do all kinds of things. And for them, all they know is that they have this set. They don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Unfortunately, we don't have as many alternatives from a feeder cattle standpoint to do that. And so we kind of have to know that stuff ourselves. We have to use it ourselves. So I, when people are marketing grain, they don't always sell it all at the same time. You know, they sell a little bit here, they sell a little bit there, they sell a little bit here, they sell a little bit there. Well, that's because, you know, it don't take a whole lot of acres to get a truckload of corn or truckload of beans or whatever it is and sell a truckload of time, that's fine. Well, if you bring in 10 truckloads of cattle in the next two weeks, you could space it out like that or you could just keep know that you have a profit objective and you wait till the market offers you that profit objective and you go ahead and knock, knock it out and you say, hey, my $200 ahead is sufficient and I'll get to do this for the next year. Now, I know, Jerry, that that wouldn't have felt so good in those years when you were making $500 a head. I understand that. But though, I, I worked with some guys out of Alabama that they, they, they knocked the top off, they knocked the top off of, of that $500 a head because they had locked in some prices. And they felt really bad about that when I talked to them. And that was in like, a, you know, things were, were, were still good. And they felt the very next time I met with them, they decided that, that the next group of cattle they weren't going to do anything with. And that's when those $300 and $400 per head losses rolled in. And you say, uh, uh. And that's just market. That's just a market loss. Y'all remember, remember when those prices went sky high? Y'all remember when they went uh, bellied up? If you bought cattle while they were really high? And then, and then the, uh, I mean, I don't, mean to, I don't mean to like, well, sure, sure you do. <laughs> exactly. Still trying to pay for it, right? But the point is, is, is this game, we talk about the business of small margins. If you hit a margin that will keep you in business all the time, you can keep this lifestyle for 40 or 50 years. And it's none of this stuff of you can't farm for a living. It's you have to farm smarter than what we used to farm 60 years ago, right? Information is available to all. Just look at your phone. So I kind of already talked about this, but you know, I'm just, I'm just thinking through it so you can see it visually. If you got $900 a head in them, you go market them at 800 pounds, and you want a profit goal of $200 per head, is that sufficient for you? I don't know. It kind of depends on how you do your budget. It kind of depends on what you consider cost. Dr. Rawls, when I do a budget for my own, you know, I put, I put a labor cost in on my stocker cattle. I mean, I do. I charge interest to my, to my to, even if it's my money. Of course, I have my land cost, even if it's my land. It doesn't matter. I have those costs in there. Because I want to get, I'm, a, I'm an economist, folks. I like to get paid twice. I want to get paid for my labor, and I want to get paid for my skill set. Does that make sense? I mean, I study stuff for a reason. I can pay people to do a lot of stuff. 
Because there's a lot of things that each of us do day to day. It don't take no, no rocket scientist to get it done. All right? Actually, we can hire a lot of school-age kids to get a lot of stuff done. Well, not nowadays. Never mind. <laughs> Might be illegal. But if, if I have this in my mind, I've got $900 in them, I need $200. Well, then I've got a price goal of a $137.50. That's what, I have to, that's what I had to get on a cash price of $137.50 to get this $200 that I want out of them. Here I am sitting every day watching the market. And how many people said they watch the market every day? Okay, for those that watch it every day, what do you do? How many people actually use that information to make decisions with it? Two or three. So why are the rest of you watching it? <laughs> you might be wasting your time. Huh? Bloomberg said it was easy. Bloom said Bloomberg, yeah. I seen, I, I seen a commercial too about him. He, he said he's there to beat Trump. That's what he said. That's, what, that's the only thing I remember for any commercial. I'm there to beat Trump. Thought she was there to be the president of the country. I'm trying to figure that one out. But anyway, if you don't, if you're doing something and you're not making decisions with it, there's no reason to do it. There's absolutely no reason to waste your time. You might as well be out there spending more time feeding cows or looking at trying to doctor sick ones. You have to sit there. I can guarantee you, I make more money sitting behind the computer looking at markets and making decisions than I ever will out in the field. I can guarantee you. And I and I do piddly stuff. Mine is very piddly, but I make more money that way. And I can also do this job, which is paid by the great taxpayers of the state of Tennessee. <laughs> and then I say, analyze all the methods of capturing the price. So this, this just gets you up to the February 6th, but uh, uh, I've got our, break, our, our price, our break evens down here on that, on that $900 calf that we won't, you know, we've got to have $900 out of them because that's what it's going to cost us. Blah, blah, blah. So that's our, that's our break-even price. My profit gold price is up here at the 137.50. Now, the futures, the August expected price, and this is a true cash price. This is a true cash price based off a of basis that think, Dr. Rawls, I told somebody the other day how thankful I was that you, you I think, I guess it was you that started the, keeping basis values for Tennessee, and it has been one of the, the, the most useful things that I have found working with people, working for myself, so thankful for it. So I, I, I do appreciate it. I want to tell you that. I didn't actually plan that, but I, literally earlier this week, I shared that with somebody. But the futures market up, and t up through February 6th, so I, you know, today it's, not, it's gone south, so we're a lot worse off. So we're probably actually under, under, under that $200 profit. But there were several days when we were over our $200 profit by locking in what the futures was offering. Well, I guess that actually was the futures price, and then you just had to take off your basis because I wouldn't know what your basis is, right? I just use what our typical basis is. But there were a lot of, I can guarantee you when we were up here, you would have met your profit goal. Guarantee it for August. So there's already been opportunities, but now the market's gone south, and so now we're going to have to look for more opportunities for that August market if you're buying cattle that are going to go out in August. Anybody buying cattle right now? Some of you buying them every day. Every week, 50 this, this week, 70 next week, whatever it is, we're buying them all the time. And so that's what we're looking at. Now, keep me on time because I forgot to set my alarm. That doesn't matter. So we got forward contracts. Sometimes they're available, sometimes they're not. I prefer flexibility. Of, of futures over forward contracts because the forward contract locks me in, bam, we're done, that's it. I've got to make sure I meet exactly what I say. All right? Futures contract has a little more flexibility in it. But if you can forward contract them, hey, have at it if it makes your money. It does require that margin money. I don't know if anybody caught it, but it's something mentioned about margin money, so it does take money in an account to make sure you can hold a position and if the market's moving against you at the time, which means you should be making money in the, in, on the cattle, but you hadn't sold them yet,
But that means they keep on, your broker keeps on calling and saying, hey, I need some more money, I need some more money. And if you've ever had to do that, then it starts to get a little squirmy. And if you're borrowing money, your lender starts saying, well, why, why are we need more money? Why do we need more money? Well, because I've protected the value in this, and so that way I can pay you back. So if your lender doesn't understand that, then you got a problem. It's important that your lender, I mean, that was a great question that was asked, you know, how often you talk to, I think it was, you right, didn't you ask that question? How often you, can cut? oh, well, there you go. Well, that's great, that's great. Don't borrow their money, you don't need it, you, no. But, but the point is, that you, you need to, you have to know what you're doing. It's okay to put, have margin calls if you know that you've made money with the cattle. Because you you might be sending money in, and the cash flow starts to get a little tough because a lot of money's going out, and you're not going to get it until the cattle are actually sold and and the cash is checked, or the the check is cashed. That's I guess that would be a little problem right there. <laughs> well, I guess the cash could be checked, right? I mean, I'm, sometimes nowadays you need to make sure. But that's a that you know we got the futures contract, then you got the options market, and then you've also got livestock risk protection insurance. And livestock risk protection insurance operates a whole lot like the options market. It just means you don't have to have a 50,000-pound load because these take 50,000-pound loads if you're truly hedging. Otherwise, you might be speculating, and speculating might be fun, but I guess you in Kentucky you can just go down here to the whatchamacallit and gamble a little bit if that's what you want, whatever, this Kentucky Downs or something like that. I, I'm not much of a gambler. Um, I like risk. I'm not a gambler. So anyway, so those are things that you can do. I'm not going to, how much time do I have, Jeff? I, I, I've only got, I mean, I only had like 15 slides. Oh, I got plenty of time. That's great. I'm, I'm smoking this. So realizing that we're, if we just sell a futures contract, so this, this is a little deeper in, into the, I'm going to give you some very basic concepts of the futures and options market and how you can use them. Because a lot of people don't understand how they're utilized and, and how to use them. And that's what keeps people from actually using them is because they don't understand how they work. Um, and I'm not going to tell you that this 45-minute presentation will teach you that. Because that's, that, um, yeah, that took me a little while longer too. Um, you figure them out in 45 minutes? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So we can, if, if we've got cattle that are going in August and we know they're physically going to sell in August, there is an August feeder cattle contract. So we would use the August feeder cattle contract. Well, see, there's not, a, there's not one for July or June. So which contract are we going to use? Still going to use the August. Right, but if we got cattle to go in November, what are we, which one are we going to use? The November. But if we have them in December, because there's not a December feeder cattle, we're going to have to go into January. All right, so, so don't, don't worry about the logistics of that. That's easy. But if we sell a futures contract, uh, we're essentially locking in the price just like a forward contract, Jimmy. I mean, that's it. We're just locking it in. Basis can fluctuate on us. The actual basis can fluctuate. In your forward contract, you might actually set a basis. You know, I don't know. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. It depends on how a contract's written, a forward contract's written. But that essentially locks us in on that price. Then we've got this put option, and this is a very, I mean, these are, these are the basic, most basic forms of hedging that you can look at. You can buy a put option, which all that does is sets a floor. So you, how many people have insurance? Anybody buy insurance on their cars or their homes? Anything like that? Sure you do. You have to have it on your car, otherwise you came here by buggy or by bicycle because you have to have car insurance in this country. Right? If you came here by, by bicycle or buggy, no problem with that. That might have been the best way. Given today's weather, I don't know. Walking could have been better. A little too far for me to do that. But you pay a premium and set a floor price. It, then, it, then it can operate just like your futures. The only difference is you don't have those margin costs. You literally just pay in your money and go on about your business. Now, I think it was Wit that asked something about how much, to, you know, how much you're spending on that stuff. Well, that's where, you know, if you just sell a futures, what it costs is your brokerage fee plus whatever margin calls you have. When it comes to a put option, it works just like LRP, and you pay a premium, and it sets you a floor price, and depending on how close you get it to what the actual price is today will depend on how much you're spending. 
Because the higher floor you sit, the more expensive it's going to be. Y'all understand that? The higher price that you think you, you can accept, the more expensive it's going to be. And then, now this is, this is not too far advanced, but it's a little more advanced. If you, if you think that, man, I don't want to spend that much, Dr. Rawls, on a put option, well, you can actually sell somebody a call and cheapen it up and leave just a portion of your top side open. So you can gain a few more dollars and not cost you so much to buy the, the floor. Now, don't, it, it, don't worry about it. If, if that's all overwhelmed you, don't worry about it. Just know that you can go home and study this stuff. And I would encourage you to go home and study this stuff because it will make you money in this business. But people always, well, I'm just going to always sell the futures or I'm just always going to do this. I'm, no, no, the market will dictate what you need to do at that time. Like right now, right now I'm telling you, I wouldn't touch the futures market or the options market. I wouldn't touch them if I had cattle for August or October or November. I think it's absolutely terrible. Now, if it, if it meets your profit objective, don't let me hold you back. Don't let, me, don't let anything I said hold you back. Because I'm just, I mean, I'm just a guy that sits in his office on occasion. You know, the, the, that, that second one's kind of, the key is to actually be active and make a decision on marketing. Because doing nothing is a decision. Unfortunately, that's where most of us fall all the time. We do nothing. Because what do we do? We just wait on what the, whatever, whatever, well, you know, I think I'm going to sell some cattle in two weeks. And the entire time you own those cattle, your decision was to do nothing. That's not a very active decision, though, right? If you're watching the market, which there were about half the people in here that actually mark that were actually watching the market, the only problem was is they weren't making decisions based on the market. And so, that, that, am I tying this in together? Am I making sense where I'm tying this in? Because you can watch the market, but if you don't make a decision, then you've done nothing, right? Essentially, done nothing. I mean, it's kind of like watching TV. Why do we waste our time watching TV? Were you really that entertained by a bunch of curse words and half-naked people and whatever they put on TV nowadays? No, you wasted your time, more than likely. Unless, unless you had a child or grandchild or somebody that was in the movie that you was watching and you just wanted to see them in the movie, you know, oh, looky there, that's my... Uh, I'll throw out a good songwriting, but anybody watch RFD TV? Anybody? Well, a good a, a good fellow I go to church with. Um, Y'all gonna see him on RFD TV. It's called Winds Feed and Seed. All right. So Win Varble's a songwriter. I go to church with him back home. Just know he's got a TV show coming out on RFD TV. I put in a little. There you go. Y'all can say y'all y'all know a guy that knows that guy. I knew I could find a way to put that in here. No, I didn't. I didn't. That just came to my mind too. But the key is that you don't have to hit the market. You don't have to hit the top of the market every year. You just don't want to lose money. But I, mean, I guarantee you, if you make money every year on every, you'll be fine. You may not have as much money as Jerry, but <laughs> but but if you're making money on every group, you'll be able to afford to keep on going. So here's here's what we do. Uh, this is a straight sale on the futures, and I'm just saying that we're at today. That would be today, right? And if we're going to sell these cattle on, on August 10th, I don't know. August 10th may be a Sunday. I really have no clue. I just arbitrarily chose it. Um, but in the cash market, if we're just going to sell a straight futures because the futures market is saying, hey, man, this is going to give me my $200 profit that we talked about, then we're good to go. They're actually trading around, what, 144 probably today? I'm off by two dollars. Anybody got that on their phone? I got it on my phone, but I'm too lazy to look. I ain't got time. They're probably August is probably around 144 on feeder cattle. 143.60. Okay, so I'm off by a little uh, two dollars and forty cents. But let's just pretend they at 146. Now, based off our basis values, Dr. Rawls, that we've been keeping, that 800 pound calf is going to be six dollars back of the board in August, and so. 
that's going to give me an expected actual cash sale price of a buck forty. Y'all remember that I told you that based off my example, we were at one thirty-seven fifty was what was going to give us our two hundred dollar profit, right? That we needed. So one forty would say we're going to make a little more than that. That that makes us feel good. Maybe, maybe not. Don't let greed get in the way of your decision making. That's this is how you get rid of greed. Right here. I'm trying to help you because greed is, is my problem. Greed is my problem. This will get you out of that, that greed aspect right here. So today, we're not going to do anything in the cash market, but we're going we're gonna to actually sell us 50, 000, we're gonna sell us one contract. That's a 50,000 pound load. And so we got a cash expected price. Now, our futures price is 146, but our cash expected price is 140. And then when we actually get to August 10th, and we, we market our cattle. Well, we ended up selling them for 130. Well, thank goodness the, the feeder cattle market went down, and so now we're like, man, we made a great decision. We made a great decision because futures went down $10. So, how much do you think you're going to make on the futures market? If you sold at 146 and you bought at 136, $10. Thank you. Participatory portion of this event right here. I got you. Three minutes. So we got 130 cash price. We made ten dollars on the futures market, which gets us back to 140. Now, will it always? We'll always see exactly six dollar basis, Doctor Rawls. No, but if it's somewhere close, we probably still come close to hitting our profit. One way or the other, doesn't really matter. We're not worried about the twenty dollars here or the twenty dollars there. We're worried about the prop, a close profit. So if I just put, put if I could just purchase a put option, I'm going through these because these don't take no time. Again, in this case, because we were trading at 146, I decided I was going to purchase a floor of 144, and it was going to cost me five dollars. So it's going to cost me five dollars to ensure that I get a floor of 144. So now I've got 144 minus my six dollar basis, which is still there, minus my five dollars, which gets me at 133. Does that meet our profit objective? No. So to me, that tells me this is probably isn't a good decision because I'm not. It's it still beats our break-even price, right? Still beats our, but it didn't meet my profit objective. But if we went through this whole thing again, we still get back to 133. That's fine. That doesn't matter. Now I could do this, put, purchase that put option and sell that call option, huh? Well, man. My expected floor price, I still had the 144 floor minus the $6 minus the 5 but I sold that call for $4. And so now my floor price is $137. do not worry about all the math. Just understand that this is how you got it in your little thing. You don't need to figure out exactly everything I'm saying right now. But would 137 be close enough to 137.50 to make somebody happy? I mean, we're talk, we talking about $4, $4 a head then. Fifty cents on the eight weights only four dollars a head. So you 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 got a one hundred ninety six dollar expected profit. Oh, oh. But that's something that you can do if you don't want to pay five dollars. Well, now you got it down to where you set a floor for essentially a dollar. Because when you spend five and you take in four, how much does that mean it cost you? A dollar. Simple math, folks. This is simple math. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. I, I had no intention of going through those things and you understanding every dollar that I was putting up there because that's not the understanding the dollars is not exactly the point of it. The point of it is for you to understand that you can use these things to actually hedge a profit. Yes, sir. So the question is he can only do that if you're a large enough operator. To use the futures and options market, you need to be in the 50,000 pound load range. But you can use livestock risk protection insurance and it is priced very similar to put options. And I, when I say similarly, I mean almost to the T. They're priced the same for the same floor price and you can do as few as one animal. And they've made some improvements to LRP and I say improvements, there's more alternatives to choose from and the subsidy has gone from 13% to to 20%, and there's the subsidies kind of range there, but 
we'll just call it 20%, depending on what you do. So it's a little more feasible now to use them than it was two years ago, or even a year ago. Man, I must have done a great job right there. What is my general? I don't have. I'm not going to say that. I'm not. I don't have a percent. I don't have a percentage. It's if it makes the profit that you're looking for, bam, you're done. That's all I want you to do. You could. You could. So the question was, if you, if you, with the fence strategy and selling, because you physically sold the call, could you have margin costs? If the price exceeds that call price, then yes. You could. Yes, sir. I want to tell you the truth. I want to buy some contracts right now. If you, I, I mean, and I'm not saying that. I mean, I mean, phys, me in my mind. I wanted to call the broker this morning and buy a couple contracts. Actually, I wanted to buy all my cattle back. Even though they're still standing there, I wanted to buy them back. And in, in most cases, I would say that that's more of a speculative position. But given what the market is telling me right now, let's put a percentage on this, it's 90% hedging, 10% speculative by doing that today because of the fall off that we had the previous two days. I guess the only reason why I didn't call the broker today and say, let's do this, is because I knew I was coming to give this talk. And if I did say, well, that's what I did, and then people are like, well, you're speculating. I'm like, well. Or I watch the markets, and I know that I could own my cattle cheaper than what I had them on for. I could, couldn't I? <laughs>